Hey everybody, Professor Davis here, ChemSurvival.com, YouTube channel Chem Survival, and uh, almost time for another Table Tuesday, and this is a special Tuesday, at least over here in the United States of America, where uh, tomorrow, which is uh, Tuesday, July 4th, uh, about all 300 or so million of my countrymen will head out into a field as the sun sets and uh, enjoy some fireworks displays. Uh, blowing stuff up is just what we do on the 4th of July. Uh, now, if you've ever enjoyed a fireworks display, and I'm betting that you have, um, you might have wondered, you know, how do they achieve those beautiful colors? And and um, the answer to that question is deeply rooted in atomic structure. In fact, when you're enjoying those beautiful colored fireworks going off in the sky, what you're really observing is a complex dance of electrons in specific elements. Uh, and so you're you're observing the the electron clouds, the electron structure of atoms when you are watching these beautiful colored embers burn as fireworks go off. So let's go into some detail about exactly what it is about atoms, um, not just specific atoms, all atoms, but certain atoms that emit these beautiful colored lights when they become excited by either electricity or by heat or by some other energy source. Now, in the past on the channel, we've talked about the Bohr model of the atom, and we specifically looked at hydrogen. And during that discussion, we talked about how hydrogen has various energy shells. Uh, even Bohr knew this back in the early 1900s. And that by exciting an electron into a higher energy state, that is one of the higher energy shells, one could observe its return to a more stable state. And that certain uh, transitions from one shell to the next corresponded to an energy that also corresponds to a photon of a very specific wavelength of light. And so something like a hydrogen atom was expected to only emit several very specific wavelengths of light in response to being stimulated electronically or by heat or by some other energy source. Uh, so what, what we called that was the line emission spectrum of that element. And in hydrogen's case, it was quite simple. But of course, we now know that the Bohr model of the atom is oversimplified. There aren't just energy shells, there are subshells. And within those subshells, there are individual orbitals, all of which can take on various energy states depending upon the specific element that we're talking about. So this diagram that we've been using to sort of make our best guess at electron configurations of elements isn't necessarily accurate. In fact, these orbital energies can change considerably depending upon which element or ion we're talking about. And so in order to look a little bit deeper into this, we have to go into something called a Grotrian diagram, which actually shows us the specific energy levels of each orbital within a given element. So let's take the example of lithium. Now, lithium is a little bit bigger than hydrogen, not much, and it actually behaves a lot like hydrogen, although it's different in some ways. And we know that it should have uh, three electrons in its uh, electron cloud. Now, those electrons have a home in, the, in the, their ground energy state. So if we were to place a lithium atom or ion inside of a firework, it's going to sit there in its ground state for most of its lifetime pretty happy. But when we set off that, uh, that firework and apply energy to those elements, those atoms of lithium, we excite the electrons into higher energy states. And they immediately go about the work of decaying back into their ground state. But in order to do this, they have to negotiate these atomic orbitals. The, so they can't just fall down any particular amount of energy. They can only move down in specific incremental amounts of energy. And those energies happen to correspond in many cases to visible light. And so as these electrons work their way back down, into their ground states, what we notice is that they emit, again, specific wavelengths of light. We get some nice little blues, we get some beautiful reds, greens, and oranges. So if we were to collect the light that is emitted by uh, an excited lithium or sample of lithium, and then disperse that light through a diffraction grating or through the use of a prism, we would expect to see this. We would expect to see its line emission spectrum. Now what your eye sees instead, when all of these wavelengths of light reach it, is that the most intense band within this is that red. And so we see this sort of characteristic pink hue when we place lithium into some kind of an exciting medium like flame or electricity. And this is true of many elements. And there are some specific elements that we like to use for these properties. You're probably mostly familiar with uh, technologies like neon lights. Now, the original neon lights use combinations of helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon, which all emit various colors when stimulated by electricity. And modern neon lights are coated with phosphors that allow us to make them any color we choose. But in the good old days, way back when these technologies were first invented, there was a very uh, restrictive color palette that was available for neon lights. Now, in the fireworks you see above the sky, 
mostly what you're looking at is lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and a couple of alkaline earth metals as well. Uh, we even throw in some wild cards there. We get beautiful greens from elements like copper and boron. So by placing these salts in with the charges in the fireworks, we can tune the color of the firework to almost any visible color that we want. Now, if you're more interested in learning about line emission spectra, I want to take you to a website today that has got some really, really beautiful representations of what these atomic spectra would look like. So I'm visiting the website atomicspectra.net today. This is one of my favorite places to geek out about atomic emission spectroscopy. Uh, it starts off with this really nice representation that shows you a thumbnail of all the different line emission spectra for all the different elements for which they are known. And that's just about all of them, honestly. Uh, you'll notice that up here we have hydrogen, helium, lithium. Notice that the smaller elements, which have more uh, fundamental, uh, very, um, simplified, let's say, uh, atomic structures, tend to have just a few emission lines in the visible spectrum. But as we get down into more complex elements, even into the second row and certainly into the third row of the periodic table, these spectra get quite complex. Uh, that's because there are more available electrons, more available uh, orbitals and subshells for them to transition through. And so we see these more complex spectra. But if you really want to have some fun with this website, what I'm going to recommend that you do is go down here to the interactive viewer. This will allow you to see some really beautiful representations of those spectra. So let's take a look at lithium, the one that we just looked at previously. So here's an example of the spectrum for lithium. Again, fairly simple as it's a fairly simple atom. Um, you can even filter down to whether you want to look at neutral lithium, lithium-1, or lithium-2 ions. Now, this website was made by a physicist. And I don't know who made the website, but I know it was made by a physicist. And the reason I know that is that physicists use a different notation for ions than chemists do. A chemist would use a, a numeral 1, 2, or 3 to indicate the charge of an ion. So lithium-1 ion would be lithium-1. However, physicists and a lot of cosmologists, astronomers instead like to use a different system where Li1 means the first state of lithium or the ground state. Li2 is then the next ion up, which would be the plus one. Li3 would be a plus two charge. Sorry, guys, I didn't make the system. I blame the physicist. <laughs> they can blame me if they want to. Nonetheless, we can filter it down to whether we want to see only the contributions of a particular ion or a particular neutral atom to this line emission spectrum. Now, lithium is quite simple, but if we work our way down, we, we can see some really interesting things. First, I want to take you to sodium. Now, you'll notice that sodium spectrum is also quite simple. But what's really interesting to me about sodium is that sodium has got this incredibly potent line here at about 589 nanometers. There's actually two of them that are very close together. But what that means is that sodium light is a very, very potent yellow color. And in fact, it's almost monochromatic. And sodium lamps which use sodium emission spectra to create light, were available long before the technology of lasers and even before really good high-precision diffraction gratings were. And so early experiments that required monochromatic light, things like polarimetry, tended to use this sodium D-line, 589 nanometers. It was a favorite of scientists in the late 1800s and early 1900s because it's the closest thing they could get to monochromatic light. Now, if we move down to a larger, more complex element, Take rubidium, for example. We see a more complex spectrum beginning to evolve. However, you can see where rubidium gets its name because it has a, a fairly large number of fairly strong lines up here in the red portion of the visible electromagnetic spectrum. Of course, the element emits a bright red light when it's placed inside of a flame. Rubidium is its name. And in fact, its neighbor on the periodic table, one row down, cesium also gets its name from a word meaning blue. Because as we can see here, although there are many fairly faint lines here in the spectrum corresponding to other transitions, the strongest transition is the one that creates this strong blue light. And so by placing a cesium sample into a flame, we get a bright blue flame rather than the bright red flame that rubidium created. So I would like to invite you to check out atomicspectra.net. It's a really fun website I like to peruse every now and then. Check out some of the line emission spectra of your favorite elements. Uh, and enjoy yourself. And in the meantime, enjoy the fireworks. Everyone have a safe holiday weekend. Uh, and as always, everybody, I'm Professor Davis from chemsurvival.com, YouTube channel Chem Survival. See you next time.